Good evening. Welcome to Telugu NRI Radio Facebook Live webinar on immigration, U.S. immigration with Lucas Garriston from Burgos and Lucas Burgos and Garriston Law Firm. So we are doing a every week and every week Wednesday at 6 p.m. Central Time. You can connect to the Facebook. Uh, maybe we we can post in you Telugu NRI Radio YouTube channel. You can go and uh, uh, view the recorded show. If you have any questions, maybe you can post in Facebook Facebook wall and uh, maybe you can correct. We provided the phone number and meeting number. You, maybe you can join to the meeting number and you can directly talk to the attorney and clear your questions and clarifications. So now we can welcome to um, welcome to Lucas. But before that one, we can discuss today a lot lot of lot of things the new government got change we'll see how does it work and uh, what is the impact on immigration system we'll see any good news or bad news uh, any uh, future new rules coming up we can uh, ask with lucas and get more information from lucas hi lucas welcome to telugu nri radio Hi, Venkat. Thanks for having me again this week. Uh, it's been one exciting week uh, since the election, since our last show. Uh, as you hinted, uh, you know, we have a new uh, president-elect at the moment, uh, you know, Joe Biden. And, uh, you, uh, you know, Donald Trump is still officially our president until uh, next January uh, when Joe Biden uh, will be sworn in as the new president. Um, so... You know, some things that we've discussed and, and spoke about the past uh, month or so, With a, a, there's been quite a few changes that have kind of been implemented week by week, almost hour by hour at times, uh, in regards to, you know, these wage levels, uh, other new rules, fee increases, and, you know, a lot of that still pending or being challenged in the courts. But, you know, overall, this is very good news where I can tell you that, uh, you know, next year, hopefully, you know, the, the tide will turn, so to speak, and we'll have a better um, luck with with normal life, I guess, uh, I guess you could say, uh, you know, with this new administration. Yeah, <clears throat> I remember you one of the meeting you said that um, choose uh, the president who going to reform the immigration system. What do you think uh, the Biden is promised? is election agenda is going to be reform the immigration system, DACA, family-based and uh, employment immigration system. So we can discuss uh, uh, one by one. So generally, first you say, what do you think? Uh, Biden will really implement all this, uh, the whatever he promised in election? Well, I think a good part of uh, the vision that he has will be implemented. Obviously, I mean, the way things work is there's always a give and a take uh, when you when you sit down and, and try and do anything through government. And I believe that, you know, the vision that has been shared or communicated up to this point is, number one, um, there's family separation issues at the border. Uh, we don't want to, you know, keep young children in cages or have them separated from their families. Um, there's also, you know, a humongous backlog with immigration court for, you know, deportation or removal cases. And uh, part of it, you mentioned DACA, uh, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. You know, hopefully we could do away with that program where we have these kids a permanent relief uh, to adjust their status and, or have some program where they can eventually become a citizen. Uh, now, before we go too in depth in all this, I, I, the, some of the notes that have been uh, put forward, both by uh, American Immigration Lawyers Association and some other advocacy groups, uh, as it pertains to H ones, is you know we want to address the humongous backlog that there is right now with uh, people with pending I one forties. Even you know the this past uh, month with the October uh, visa bulletin now November. You know, we've, we've had a, you know, tremendous uh, ability to go ahead and file a tremendous amount of uh, petitions or applications for uh, people who've been in H-1B status for many years. Um, 
one of the suggestions would be anyone who has an approved I-140 um, that doesn't yet have an visa available that we could always file adjustment of status regardless of whatever the filing date might be um, or the final action date. Some other uh, pointers that have been suggested from our organization would be to go ahead and just get rid of the backlog. You know, anyone who has pending adjustment of status or has, you know, an I-140 that we could go ahead and have those visas issued so we could have more, you know, permanent uh, ties here because a lot of our uh, valuable assets that we have are, in our economy are, you know, tied to H-1B visas uh, and the services that they, that the visa holders of, you know, provide. And I, I know per- firsthand, you know, over the past two years, you know, maybe 20 people that I know personally have gone on to Canada, uh, you know, to try and have more stability. You know, it's difficult to not know what tomorrow is going to bring and to have this temporary nature of the of uh, living. And, um, you know, hopefully we can have more stability with that. Uh, and then progressing to H-1B visas, you know, hopefully we can, I believe this new rule we've talked about, perhaps more of a uh, a bidding process with wage levels that should, you know, be rescinded. Uh, it probably won't go into effect at all. And, and, you know, currently we have the issues with the wage levels and things like this, and that should go back to normal as well. Um, and, you know, I heard today from my wife, uh, she mentioned that uh, Bernie Sanders uh, was uh, maybe uh, offered the position of Department of Labor uh, or the Secretary of Labor with the Department of Labor. So, you know, obviously that would help <laughs> revert back to the way things used to be. And, you know, it would be more of a positive uh, for anyone who's an H-1B visa holder at the moment. I think you are, you are saying a lot of good news. So hopefully, whatever you said, it's going to implement it. Definitely, it will help to the immigration people, uh, the way backlog on <clears throat> immigration system. So it even, even I hear whoever understand the immigration system, if, if uh, maybe Ben Sanders become a DOL chief or something, he, I think he's a better understanding of the immigration system. Maybe if he if he reform in DOL system, maybe it will uh, help helpful to the uh, most of the immigration wages level or companies. So before uh, it means next we go for the next step. Uh, you said it means uh, uh, Biden will reform all immigration system. Maybe he will remove the per quota country. Before that one, I want to, I have a one question on sure. family-based uh, green card numbers. The, due to the pandemic situation, all council processes are closed. So the whatever the numbers left over in family-based, uh, Trump will add it in, add it in um, employment basis, em- employment numbers. So if Biden take both on January 20, after that, Will Biden reward this family numbers to family based system from well I I that's a good question. I think that that's a very good possibility. Now you have to remember too that these so-called bans are temporary in nature. Um, and you know really, it was probably unnecessary to have such a a, a long duration of uh, you know this ban uh, or you know, closure of the consulates where you can't go for your interview and finish the consular process. You know, um, I really believe what you want to look at and what you want to pay attention to is what's going to happen uh, within the first 100 days. Okay, like what we discussed last week and the week before, typically an administration will set forth their agenda in those 100 days and it'll be a broad vision. What do we want to do as it relates to immigration? How do we want to address the main issues that are within the immigration system that are broken? So, I mean, I think as uncomfortable as it might be for uncertainty and things like this with H-1Bs or the new rule requirements, that you know, probably the agenda, the first thing on the, the to-do list would be to help stop separating families, to keep people from being locked in cages, you know, and, and 
you know, we would just go down the list from there. You know, obviously we want to reform our immigration courts, uh, allow the docket to move at a much faster pace. You know, we have some cases that are, if you have a case that started today or tomorrow, it would be, uh, you know, maybe 2023 or 2020, late 2022 before you would have your first court appearance. And, um, you know, that, that level a, a backlog is something that needs to be addressed. And then obviously number three is probably going to be, Hey, we have to fix this uh, tremendous backlog of our talented uh, employment uh, based in immigration, because we have so many people who contribute to our economy that are more or less, you know, wanting to stay here and have a pathway to citizenship and have uh, the ability to plan and prepare for the future, you know, we need to have a certainty. So, you know, that if I commit five years of living here, that there's options if I choose to eventually become a citizen and, you know, what career do I want? What pathway do I want? You know, and these are all important things that need to be addressed. And I, I feel really hopeful that uh, these will be uh, a, a addressed in the first 100 days. And, and, you know, from there we'll have, many, many, many more discussions on the specific details of what's to come. Okay. So the Biden, maybe it is still we have the two and a half months time to see after all, what is the take on our immigration system? If really in 100 days, he will take on next level, next more, maybe everyone relax in your United States and uh, Enjoy the life. <laughs> that is a, a very good news. Actually, um, the most of the immigration admins, you, you already told that admins, so the 20 members went to the Canada due to the immigration issues. So this will be uncertainty, their um, life and their, uh, their kids and everything. It, it, it will impact the entire the family. You mentioned a good point to keep all family members together so that their life will lead uh, peacefully. So hopefully it will happen one, when it, once. Well, so, and that's another thing uh, uh, that we mentioned many times, you know, over the past two months, if you have the opportunity to file for GC, have your foot in the door, because when the changes come, it, the one of the changes might be anyone who has an approved uh, I-140 with a pending adjustment of status, they might say, hey, the visa is immediately available and it could go much faster than the traditional waiting and backlog of the visa bulletin. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So, Lucas, I, I have a question. We can go for the H-1B high wages. You said that uh, it, gonna, it, it will not uh, implement it maybe once uh, Biden took over. The what if uh, in between this, this uh, high wages will it will implement it from the december 8 uh, 2020 right whoever apply after december to december december 8 2020 will they take the new high wages form or LCA? i think how does it work here so we're talking about two things in is one okay so the new wage levels came out a few weeks back um and and there's a pending court cases uh, about those right now that, you know, are entering the argument stage to have an injunction issued. Um, the lawsuits handled by AILA, American Immigration Lawyers Association, uh, I think up until Monday uh, was taking, um, you know, proof uh, from practitioners and their clients uh, of harm, actual harm. So to win an injunction for the court to suspend this new rule, we have to show actual harm uh, in, in regards to how the higher wages are going to affect business and damage business or damage the uh, employer's ability to conduct business. So uh, those were all submitted. The deadline was this last Monday. And I'm, you know, I would imagine that there's going to be a, a subsequent uh, arguments or hearings this week. And hopefully, you know, maybe by the end of this week, early next week, we should have some more clarity on that. And like I said, there's another two or three other uh, lawsuits pending. So maybe an injunction comes before then. Now, when we first started answering this question, when I said there's two parts to it, the other part you're referring to in December 
is a, a proposed rule. Now that proposed rule has already been uh, suspended. It's put to the side, and that rule probably will never see the light of day now that Trump's not going to be president because that rule was in part showing that, uh, you know, going back to third-party offsite specialty employment, um, you know, you want to see they were trying to change the forms to include more information uh, in regards to how they could uh, the service could, you know, question the LCA and how the job duties align with what the, you know, LCA might be. Um, and also the what the one year duration and, you know, these other contexts that I think we're all in that rule, that rule is put aside at the moment and it's probably, you know, not going to happen. So um, the only rule we have right now that's really affecting us is uh, the wage level rule. Uh, increasing the wage levels and then um, potentially right now it's in comment period is the new rule for the H1B lottery. Now um, we, we believe uh, immigration attorneys, we believe that it won't really impact us next year when it comes time for the lottery, because a lot of the rules that are done are so far outside the scope of the statutory limit that uh, it really uh, goes against what the law is, is right now, what the, black and white version of the law so there, there it'll be a balance and everything will move back to the way things were you know four years ago okay the lucas you mentioned all the the new regulatory rules which are going to be october maybe december 8th after december 8th what about the speciality occupation definition in what is a is going to change or they will continue to the they change the speciality occupation definition what is your so, thoughts on this one? So the specialty occupation definition is codified. And what codified means is it's in our law. So Congress actually said, you know, there's four ways you can have a specialty occupation. Any one of the four requirements that you can meet qualify as a specialty occupation under H-1B. Um, now, having just said four small sentences, it's very difficult for Congress to legislate exact detail from that. So USCIS has a little bit of uh, ability here in, through their rulemaking process to determine, okay, we have this sentence, it means this. Now, when we look and adjudicate the cases, we're going to apply it to these standards. And, you know, typically you still have to stay within the scope of what the meaning of the statute is. So to say it's going to change and change so much, that's what these lawsuits are about. It's either with outside the scope of what the law is or the proper procedure to change the rule to how the service is going to apply it hasn't been conducted appropriately. Okay. So just you spoke about the high wages. Um, this is regarding to the CAP 2020, right? 2020, right, Lucas? 2021 now. So right now, so like if I file an LCA at the moment, there's a lot of people um, that are, you know, using alternative wage surveys and things like this at the moment. But if I filed an LCA at the moment using OES uh, data, which is from the Department of Labor, it's going to show the higher wage rate. So here in Dallas, a level two wage for a software developer would be right around 94000 Now it's uh, well north of 120000 so uh, you can see the, the effect, the dramatic effect that would have. Uh, so, you know, like I said, is I expect maybe within a week to 10 days, that's going to go away uh, and everything will go back to normal. Okay. The word over the cap 2021 now, um, they are going to be implement the new process, uh, removing the ladder system and uh, bringing the hives paid salaries approval, H-1B approval. What is take on this one? What is your suggestion? Or maybe well, you can share whatever you... I mean, I, I think even if all the rulemaking procedures are followed and everything's done correctly, um, I think it's still very susceptible to a lawsuit because, you know, it clearly states within the, the code that you know, if the numerical limits are are met, a lottery is supposed to be conducted, and it doesn't spe specify that it's uh, a lottery based upon bidding of the who's going to pay the highest wage. Okay, 
So that's completely not even in the the Immigration Nationality Act or any, it's not codified in any uh, regulation that we have. Um, so what, it, what I, it would be is a, you know, an easily challenged case that would go to court. Now, just as uh, we spoke at the beginning of the show, you know, Biden's just now, you know, elected president. So that's probably a policy he's not going to uh, follow through with, and we would revert back to what it was before. And, um, you know, a lot of large tech companies, uh, have filed suits and also have other actions. Obviously they have connections where they can speak to senators or congressmen or even the administration from, you know, Microsoft, Apple, Google, uh, you know, so they have the access to maybe say, Hey, look, you know, we have so many resources here that our business will suffer if you implement all these rules. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't believe that that's really going to be something that's going to be uh, implemented. And, um, you know, it, it should next year should remain the same as this year as far as the H-1B cap goes. Okay. But anyway, in March, maybe they open for lottery uh, cap 2021 application start from the March 2021. So by end of March 20 might be get more clarify what which process is going to implement in cap 2021 that's right so you know here's a, here's another you, part of the process to consider um this year we we did a registration system where we're putting the someone's name their birthday their passport number and their country of origin uh to get a registration selection. Uh, we're not including any LCA information or anything else until the person goes and, you know, we get selected and we're able to file the case. So um, there's a whole other component to that system that would have to be created and implemented. Uh, and I just don't, from what I've heard, I don't think they're anywhere close to having that system created uh, or implemented or even tested. So, um, I would I would not worry about that if you're currently an F1 student wanting to, you know, throw your hat in the ring next year and, and try again for the H1 cap. Uh, I think it, everything will be business as usual. Okay. In terms, I hear uh, Biden will increase the H1B quota. Every year we have the 65 plus 20,000 master quota, right? will have any chance to increase the H-1B quota for 2020, maybe not 2021, maybe 2022? Uh, that's always the possibility. You know, when the program was first administered, the, they had so many numbers in the first so many years, and it would decrease, and they go down to that number every year thereafter. And uh, there there could always be definitely something like that where – Instead of the 65K, they, maybe they say, look, there's such demand and such need, we can up it to 150K or, you know, whatever the limit might be that, that's reasonable for the government. You know, they, they could scrap the H-1B visa altogether and they could say, look, maybe we're going to have, uh, you know, a, a software developer visa, quote unquote, that, that allows more people to, to utilize this. Maybe it's an uncapped visa. <laughs> much like a, you know, a TN visa or anything else. And, um, you know, that's a possibility. And, and there's really anything, it's a, it's a clean slate because anyone can come up with a better idea, I think, than what we have right now. Uh, this, this idea that we have now was, you know, created, you know, 30 years ago. And um, at the time, it met the, the needs uh, of what was required. But since then, um, you know, it's a, it's an old clunker that we need to, to renovate and fix and refurbish because it's not meeting the needs and the demand of what the market shows today. Okay. So, Lucas, um, maybe I'm going to the next uh, H4. Mm -hmm. H4 EAD brought by Obama and uh, Trump is continued to accept it, it giving to the H4 EAD what is uh, in Biden administration? Will they continue to H4 EAD or is there any information that continue or not continue? Well, that was brought up in some of the talking points um, 
Ayla has, you know, as far as the, what we want to see addressed, you know, we, if, if when this was came up with Obama, the whole purpose is uh, we want family unity. That's a tenant, a core concept of immigration law. And part of family unity is not is so much anymore of a single person uh, working. You know, uh, a household today requires maybe one or two people to work for it to fully function. Uh, we don't want to limit someone. Uh, obviously, you know, if, if you are here and your spouse is on H1, we don't want to limit you and, and you maybe the best part of your career from working just because a visa is not available or, or some other circumstance. So, uh, you know, again, maybe something, um, an, another concept that was brought up, for example, is uh, we spoke about the visa bulletin and what visas are available. And we spoke last week about how we factor and estimate how far the dates move. And part of that is to say, you know, we have one visa, but usually a person has three people in the family. So it's really not one I-140, it's one I-140, but three people on average. And what we were, what our organization is also uh, proposing is that we do away with uh, any derivative that might uh, um, be counted against the, the country quota. So instead of, you know, every one I-140 that's now ready for the visa to be on the final action date uh, and then taking three visas, it would be just one by one by one, so it would move much faster. Uh, something else that's also been suggested is to do more to protect uh, these younger kids that might age out. So there's a lot of kids that might be 17, 18 years old. Uh, you you know you might file right now to try and you know have as part of it as a derivative in your I-140 filing with your adjustment of status, and by the time the visa is available, they would have aged out. Uh, and that you know they have to start from scratch again, pretty much. So there's many, many, many uh, discussions that are going on right now, and H4 EAD is one of those discussions where we don't want to, uh, you know, have anything temporarily suspended or taken away. And in fact, we want to enhance that so uh, you know the whole family unit itself can be more secure. No, okay. So uh, Lucas Hinman in uh, Trump administration brought uh, fingerprints in H4 process. So what do you think um, the Biden ad administration will continue to add the biometrics on H4 or maybe go away in some sometimes later? Can you, you know, share that, your work? That's a very good question. Sorry to interrupt, but that's a very good inter question here. The, the main uh, requirement, obviously, every time you get biometrics, it's an $85 fee. So I don't know how much of this was done based upon data to say, look, you know, these H4s we have, you know, 15% of them are criminals and, you know, they fall out of status or they're bad people. So we need to constantly fingerprint and make sure we're staying on top of that, you know. Or is this just something where it's like, hey, look, we can get extra $85 and make it more difficult for people to get these visas. So if I were to guess, I haven't seen the data, so I, I'm just guessing. But if I were to guess based upon H4 and the, everything else that might transpire, I would say the, it, it's probably feasible to do away with the biometrics uh, because I, I can't imagine that... Uh, <laughs> You know, these biometrics are conducted and they're catching uh, people who've broken the law or are a danger to the community. Okay. So because uh, the the fingerprints on H4, it's taking a long, long time to get approved, maybe get the EAD. So this is causing current employment, the whatever the current employment. So as we know, the companies are allowed only validity data of EAD. So after that, maybe they come out from company and uh, they maybe they go back or maybe they they go, they will search the new new job. This is impacting on the the employment personally. So if uh, Biden think and uh, remove the fingerprints on H4, so it will help a lot of, lot of people 
um, I, the process. I think so. I think that that's a good point you brought up. And, you know, I have many examples, you know, here today I received an approval notice for H-4 EAD. And that was the, the principal immigrant, the H-1 visa holder, their case was uh, approved in February. So you can see this dramatic and drastic uh, elongation of, of waiting periods. Uh, and it's just, all it's going to do is keep getting uh, more backlogged. So, um, you know, that's, that's one key point I think should be addressed. Uh, another thing maybe uh, they should, they can change the policy where H4 EAD can, you know, work on the receipt of the uh, extension. So there, it's not such an abrupt ending to uh, employment. And then most importantly, which I think this has been the manipulation all along, uh, you know, part of this CARES Act that just passed was increased the premium processing fees, as we all know, from 1440 to 2500 But it also allowed USCIS, if they choose to implement, that they can now uh, have premium processing for H4 EAD. Now, they haven't implemented this yet, but they have the ability to in the future. But it's still, I mean, you're already paying the fee, um, $370, $85, for the biometrics for the H4, and then you're pay, paying $410 uh, on top for the EAD. So that's already a, a, a pretty expensive uh, burden right there that you're being placed, you know, to have to, to, to renew. And that's not even including any attorney fee or anything else. And then now to ask, well, if you want it in a reasonable time, you're going to have to pay another $2,500. You know, that should not be uh, acceptable. And we need to fix that where the wait times aren't so long. Okay. So as we're discussing on H4, H4 process and H4 EAD, we got a question from Facebook from Ajay. The H1 is denied and I-94 is expired, but uh, applied H4, they applied in H4, but still in um, process, not approved it. So my previous client is offering full-time now. What are my options? Well, uh, Ajay, thanks for uh, the question. And uh, specifically, I'd have to know if you changed uh, your status before your I-94 expired. If you did, um, you know, and you had your I-539 submitted before your I-94 expired, while it's pending, you're still maintaining status. And if you also want to, you know, request EAD, if your spouse has uh, an I-140 approved, um, you know, you can do that. Uh, and obviously once you have your H4 EAD, you'd be able to work um, at that point. Now, if you're asking about just the denial itself and you're basically using H4 as a safe harbor, um, it's probably, I, I've done it before both ways where we've, had a H4 application filed to change status uh, before the the I-94 expired, and then uh, while that's pending, it, you know you get another option. You can go back to H1. Uh, typically, best practice would be you'd want to have the I-94 in hand before you do that, unless it's just an emergency. But I think uh, maybe that was more of what you, the question was that you were asking. But if you need any more clarification. Uh, you know, you can let us know and I'll try and help the best I can. Okay. Uh, I think, Ajay, you got answer. If still, if any need clarification on your um, scenario, just send to the email info at uh, bgimmlaw.com. So, Lucas will reply. So, and one more question from the Ajay too. So this question may be on visiting. My mom is here on visiting visa. I applied for extension on May 3rd and uh, requested until November 3rd, but we haven't have any update from USCS. And we got fingerprint appointment on November 3rd. So should we apply one more extension or can we wait until they give a decision? Well, Ajay, that's a good question. Um, in normal circumstances, it would probably be best. Now, you can get one extension um, if she's a, a B2 visitor, okay? Um, due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, there's 
alternative measures you can take if it's difficult to travel or it's too dangerous to travel. Um, you can get deferred departure. You can, uh, you know, do certain things like that to where your mom's not going to fall out of status. But typically what you need to do, as long as that I-539 is pending, uh, she's maintaining her status while, while here. But if, if, you know, you already have an itinerary set up, a flight booked, and then, you know, something comes up, like right now we're in a second wave, so to speak, of this uh, pandemic, uh, then you could go and speak to uh, a CBP officer. Um, and, and there's different contact informations for different airports. Uh, <clears throat> most attorneys will have that information, and I can share it with you if you want. And you would just do uh, what we would call a deferred departure, and they can keep deferring that until it's uh, appropriate for her to travel. Okay. So, Lucas, I have a question. You brought an um, interesting point. Is a second wave, all right? The maybe last twenty four hours, it gone to two hundred thousand. So, what is if uh, got second wave? The U.S. will give some um, grace period to stay, or maybe how? What is approach to the U.S. is get more admin, grace period for grace period? Whoever the fall into the the edge of the stay limit or maybe ending the stay limit? Well, you know, it's something that's always been available, but it's been utilized much more uh, this past year. And it's what we call deferred departure. And you can uh, request, uh, you know, the Customs and Border Patrol to say, you know, look, I was supposed to depart by this date, but due to these circumstances, uh, I cannot depart or travel or go home. Here's my plane ticket. Here's my itinerary. Here's the reservation I have. And uh, here's how it's, um, here's how it's been uh, canceled. Hold on. And uh, hold on one second. Can you see me? Yes. Uh, all right. So based upon that, uh, what happens is uh, um, you you can contact the, the uh, Customs and Border Patrol, and they'll go ahead and, and extend that I-94, uh, and it'll be what we call like a deferred departure. So I have a list, you know, all the major airports and everything. And like I said, if anyone needs that, uh, just email us. Uh, we'll share the list and help point you in the right direction if something like that were to come up. So, mm. you know, it's important to you know stay on top of that make sure um you know families are kept safe and, and you know if you need to stay extra time then we we can take care of it yeah yeah ajay i think you got answer but uh, still if you have any clarification just send to email info at bgimmlaw.com so you can get the more information at the at the same time lucas said that he can share the all uh, the international airport cbp information so you can go and uh, extend i-94 maybe get yeah get uh, updated i-94 uh, lucas uh, if we come to the 485 process in pandemic situation it taking a long time maybe how many months I, i'm not sure how many months now is process uh, is there any chance a new president administration will got down to the less process time? Well, that's a good question. So, again, we spoke about this for H4 EAD. We have biometrics appointments. So, to, to revamp or to cover again what we discussed the previous weeks, there, the process timeline is going to be if you file your adjustment of status application approximately six weeks or so uh, later, you're going to get your receipt. Once you get your receipt for all your applications, your I-45, your I-140 if you downgraded, your I-131 and your I-765, then approximately uh, two or three weeks later, depending on what city you live in and how many p other people applied, you'll get a biometrics appointment. Now, if your visa is not at the final action date yet, uh, Everything's going to pause at that moment. Now you'll get your EAD and advanced parole, but your visa is going to not be processed. Your 45 is going to sit there and wait until the final action date is current. Now, going back to this, if something wonderful happens and, and they say anyone with a pending 45 
you know, that the visa is current now that we're just going to say, look, here's extra 50K, 150K, 500K visas, whatever it is uh, to apply to this backlog. Um, then it would take probably another uh, six or seven months in normal processing time. So, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of factors involved. You know, are we still going to have the requirement of biometrics at every step? Uh, for because if you have H4 EAD with biometrics, that also anyone with a uh, EAD for um, you know GC, it you know that's they don't have different biometric offices for different people, you know, doing biometrics for different things. So it, the the line stays long. Now if they take away H4 EAD and maybe some other classifications, it's much faster to have your appointment, which means it's faster to process the EAD, uh, so on and so forth. So you know, less requirements makes things move faster. More requirements makes things move slower. <laughs> okay. So just a one question um, on uh, Ajay, the first question. I think uh, they applied the H4 as soon as I-94 got denied. What is uh, the scenario? Is it potentially risk or? Well, it is potential risk. So if you filed the... Uh, so, so here's the situation. Let's say you filed an extension uh, and you saw online your extension was denied uh, and your H4 had already expired. Well, that, that you're kind of in a difficult spot at that point. Um, now, if you filed, uh, I'd have to know specifically the dates filed to really kind of go into detail. There, there's certain processes and procedures you might be able to to do or follow, but for the most part, your your lifeline is that I-94. You never want that I-94 to expire or, um, you know, because at that point, you the only alternative would really be going for stamping, and uh, that's something that's not even available at the moment. Uh, you know, if you, if you did go stamping, unless, you know, there's some urgent need or something that would fit within uh, those requirements at this time. Okay. So here, uh, Lucas, to understand, if anyone fall in this situation, the, what are the steps? Is there any waiver process to apply and uh, clear the, on uh, what is the, clear any kind of the scenario? Well, so when you change status from one status to another, you have to maintain your status. Now, if you file late, there's, uh, I think, four requirements. You have to, the late filing is at no fault to the person who's the non-immigrant visa holder. So if it's H1 or you're trying to get to H4, that the late filing is no fault of your own, um, that you've maintained your non-immigrant status before that time, that you're not in removal proceedings, and that you're still valid uh, or able to receive that non-immigrant benefit. So those are the four points that typically are are used for that determination and if you if you're able to show through and, and this is where it's very difficult for me to tell you in broad terms it's very much uh person to person so if there's very good reasoning and you can get affidavit of support to list that this is why this happened or maybe something is out of your control or maybe i can't this happened because of the pandemic and then i can't go you know all these are factors that you can use for your for evidence and then based upon the totality of the evidence everything put together uh, you might have a good case uh, to move forward okay thank you thank you lucas so just we go for uh, the last four years the trump bring a lot of the new rules on immigration system so it's still in january 2020 what do you think uh, the end of the his tenure will uh, implement any new rules on immigration system or continue to the whatever they impose the new rules. What do you think on last uh, Trump administration? I think he did a lot of things. Uh, it means a country's ban, travel ban, a consulate. Uh, it means still open, is still closed on January 1st, 2021. So do you have any information on this one? How the Trump administration react on this? You know, uh, these are all good points. And I think when you're talking about bans and 
consulates closing and things like this, I think you have to look at, you know, currently what's going on. You know, you and I are here in Texas and we've just hit the 1 million case mark for coronavirus. So it's probably not, you know, a safe place to be right now. There's other places that you could go country by country and say, you know, this is safe or not safe. And that that should be an impartial decision based upon science uh, to reopen. Uh, as far as like a, just a blanket ban, I don't think you'll see so much of that. Uh, but I think carrying over to Joe Biden administration, I think you have to be responsible to say, you know, it's dangerous, especially if you're going to ask your mom or family members to go and get stamped in, the, in this type of pandemic. We don't want anyone to get sick or die uh, for, for it's unnecessary. Uh, that's one. Uh, two, I, I think, you know, what we've touched on before with um, these changes, uh, you know, one thing we haven't discussed much is these FDNS uh, site visits where mm -hmm. the officers now, they'll call each candidate or they'll try and go to the end client. You know, obviously right now a lot of people are working remote uh, because of the pandemic and, and there's a lot of the headaches where officers are following up to see, you know, are you really working here? What are your job duties? Are you doing this? Did you pay your employer for your visa? The, you know, all these questions they ask. So I, I think if you look at it logically, if they, if someone's looking at, you know, mathematically to say we're, we're only catching 0.01% fraud doing all this extra work, I think they're probably going to stop that because I haven't heard of many, uh, if any, uh, fraudulent behavior actually picked up by this. It's not like there's, uh, employers with uh, 200 people on bench just sitting here, right? Uh, you, you know, that wouldn't make any sense. So I, I think some of these provisions are going to go back to where it was before. Um, you know, for the most part, everything's going to operate the same under these uh, the current laws in the system. It's just the enforcement and application is what's going to change. And, and that's something that, you know, I'm looking forward to because it would mean a lot of less headaches because, uh, as attorneys, we, we care. We don't want people to have a case denied or people to have to leave the country or make, you know, quick decisions on what to do as far as like, uh, you know, what they need to do for their family. So hopefully it brings more stability back, uh, you know, starting next year. Okay. So hopefully he won't continue or maybe he will not bring new rules the last tenure. So, the Lucas, we can we can go to the next question. Just understanding about the immigration rules and bills. The here um, there are the different approaches to approve the rules or bills, right? Like is um, the Congress one is a regulation. The one is the president itself. He can um, approve if whatever the new rules or something. So, can you give the rough information? The, which rules are goes to the Congress and which rules goes to the regulation and which rule, which maybe immigration rules goes to the president to get approved? That's a good question. So I would like to, for, for, if you ask this question, you have to think about um, maybe like a pyramid. Okay. So at the bottom of the pyramid, it's much larger than the top, right? And as you progress up, the it gets less and less and less until you reach a point. So if you take a pyramid and you put it in uh, sections, you know Congress typically will will create a law or, or something of the effect that would add on or fix probably the top third of the pyramid. But underneath the pyramid is a huge base uh, that still has to be there to support it. So Congress can't. Uh, I mean, there would be a, a, a law that would be so long that it would be manuals and manuals and manuals of books, and it would still not account for everything that the agency needs to do to, to operate. So we have, you know, the, administra the, the APA, which is what the administration or the agencies use, um, to create small rules on how they apply the laws that Congress writes. So as we know, uh, both houses of Congress can advance and pass a law and it goes to the president, he'll sign it into law. And under the uh, APA, uh, 
you know, each agency will be able to administer rules of what they need to do to where they can, um, you know, use the, you know, follow the law, uh, so to speak. Now, the agencies are all in the executive branch, which mean that they're the, that's the branch that enforces the law or applies the law to what it needs to be uh, for it to be done. And Congress uh, is particularly just writing the laws, you know, and then we have our judicial branch that uh, interprets the laws and makes sure everything's constitutional. So within this framework, the agencies have the ability to propose rules. Uh, the public is a part of our rulemaking process, has the ability to comment on the rules. And, you know, if so many people say, you know, that's not good, this isn't the best way to do it, we should do it this way or something else, that all that's taken into account on the public record and they determine whether or not the rules should be issued. Now, the Trump administration has pretty much hijacked this to say, well, we don't care what people say or think or how it impacts anything. We're just going to do the rule because that's our that that's our policy. And, uh, you know, that's kind of abusing the system. And that's why there's been so many court challenges. And for the most part, that's why so many court challenges have won, uh, because there has been such abuse of power. And uh, like I said, you know, hopefully now with the new uh, administration, you know, things go back to more of a normal operating procedure. Uh, and that's what, you know, we hopefully, you know, have next year. Okay. The Lucas here, yeah, just um, the quick understanding, let's say if any immigration, family immigration changes or uh, maybe new rules will go to the regulation or Congress? It, I believe, um, you know, it's going to go through Congress. Uh, that, that, that has to be the, the best way of getting this done. So, you know, Congress can pass a law that, set, that keeps the framework of what we have now and just, uh, you know, tweaks it to say, like, well, instead of this many visas, we're going to double it or triple it or reduce it. Whatever it is, they can do that. Uh, okay. That would be keeping the skeleton. Now, you could also have something revamped and completely new you know, set up, and then if both houses of Congress pass that, then, uh, you know, that would be the new system, and, it, and we would go start from there fresh. Yeah. I think per, uh, remove for per, per country quota, this is also go for Congress, right? Correct. So Congress is the one that authorizes everything. Congress says, you there, here's so many visas. Here's the cap for H1s. Here's the process for H1s. Here's for family-based. Here's, you know, for VAWAs, for victims of uh, uh, domestic violence or um, people who have T visas for victims of human trafficking or U visas, victims of crime. There's so many different, you know, visas out there. I, I, I do know this. I know there's a, quite a few people that have had a lot of trouble with L visas. A lot of people who work for Cognizant or other larger companies and uh, the denial rates of L1 visas are so out of hand at the moment that, um, you know, that's also going to be something that, that they're going to address and fix because that's it's, that's been completely unacceptable for, you know, the past two or three years now. Okay. So uh, just understanding about the Congress, right? I think uh, the new government maybe got only the 46 right now, the Democrats. And uh, Republic already got the 48. Maybe Democrats, maybe they will Georgia and maybe Georgia in two two Senates. So if any if any bill need to pass in Senate, it should have the 60 votes. Maybe 60 votes. Here, the both Democrats and Republican Republican doesn't have the majority uh, votes in Senate. What is your take on in this one, it means what, what, do you, what do you think, if any new bill comes to the Senate, uh, will going to pass or maybe I it think, will stay? I think that's the best part of our American democracy, actually. I, I think the best thing is probably not to have everything uh, one party control because what you want is collaboration. You want people to say, look, this is America. We're working together to find the best solution for America. You know, one side doesn't have all the answers. So in a perfect world, you know, we would say in the House, which is probably majority Democrat. I think it's I think it's going to stay that way. Um, then 
they can pass a bill and advance it to the Senate. The Senate, if it's Republican control, we can compromise. We can say, look, I want to let, you know, everyone in the world to come to the United States unlimited. And someone might say that that's not a good idea, but we want to fix this problem. You know, that's usually where the best uh, solutions come from is when we have uh, a working agreement or collaboration or compromise. And of course, if the president's on board with everything, it only takes, uh, you know, 51 uh, votes, 50, 51 votes, depending on which party's, you know, sending it through uh, for the president to go to his desk and be signed into law. So I'm very optimistic. You know, I, I think um, our country's at a, a better odds, of, you know, from a, a policy and a party standpoint. But I think it's a great opportunity also to, to heal and come together. And I think, you know, no matter what, I, th- there's a huge problem. And the problem is only going to get worse if we don't address the, the, our immigration uh, issues at the time. And, you know, there hasn't been a complete update to our system in 30 plus years. And, uh, you know, it's time for a comprehensive immigration reform. And, you know, whatever good ideas there might be. You know, um, I think the best ideas always end up at the top and mediocre ideas, you know, in the middle and the bad ideas at the bottom. So whoever comes up with the ideas, it shouldn't matter. And we should all work together to try and find the best uh, solution for this problem. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So we discussed a lot of uh, administration process till now. Just I want to touch base. October and November visa bulletin. Where we are, are we getting any receipts out? Are still pending? Still pending. It's still pending. <laughs> for, for, like I said, it's going to be four to six weeks. Um, if you know you submitted your own check, you can check and see if the check cleared. Uh, on the back of the check should have a case number. Um, and uh, but you know probably uh, here in the next couple of weeks we'll start getting receipts in. Okay. So, in, in maybe uh, it means uh, everyone is applying in uh, downgrade in October visa bulletin. We'll see in next couple of months what is uh, the maybe receipts and uh, is any everyone waiting for what is going to be the approval process? Will they get any RFEs or will they get any uh, queries on downgradable? Everyone eagerly waiting for the um, that one, hopefully, still it taking it taking uh, four to eight months. We'll see in the next uh, couple of months to get this receipts and uh, and status I think, too. I think you know every, everything goes with a grain of salt, and I think you should also remember that uh, you know an I one forty process is uh, you know, you might get I one the RFE for that. Everyone's probably going to get RFEs for their adjustments. Even if you submitted your medicals, the medicals will probably expire, and you'll have to, you know, get another medical before your interview. Um, so, I mean, everyone should look at it as just uh, today is is the day. You know, we sit everything in. I can't control anything what's going to happen in the future. I get the receipt tomorrow. That's then I have a receipt. But like I s- said earlier in the show. I encourage everyone who has the opportunity to file to at least have a placeholder because you never know what could happen. You don't know. You don't want to be sitting here in, in February or March and hear that, oh, there's a new law or a new provision that anyone with a pending adjustment of status application is going to go ahead and uh, have their visa fast tracked because then it might maybe it doesn't apply to you because you don't have a pending adjustment of status application. So. These are all things to consider and, you know, to be um, stay up to date with as far as the news and everything else. Okay. So we are at the end of the show. Lucas, can you share if anything you want before closing the show? Well, I like I say every week, you know, follow us on Facebook and uh, for NRI, Tele, Telugu NRI <laughs> Radio, and also our office at BGIMMLAW uh, on Facebook. And, uh, you know, we try and update as much as we can, as fast as we can. Um, uh, you know, there's been a lot of moving uh, re- legislation at the moment or rule make, rulemaking processes that are kind of in motion. And, 
you know, it's a lot of different things happening at one time. So, you know, just uh, follow us on our pages and then just watch us on our weekly show. And, and we appreciate participation as, you know, uh, anyone that wants to message or call in. Uh, it, it's not just helping you, but it's helping the community, you know, share information because maybe someone has a similar question or query that you might have uh, that we're addressing and talking about. Yeah, that, that's true. So, yes, we bring this platform to provide the more information on USA immigration to the community so everyone get the simplified information. We are ready to help to the combination com, you know, community. You you can send your maybe if you want to know the immigration topic or if you have any scenario, if you have any question, you can post um, your your question on Telugu Radio Facebook or BGIMM Law Facebook, or you can send email to info at bgimmlaw.com and get more information on immigration system and uh, your scenario and get more information and uh, stay uh, peacefully. So don't, it means don't fear and, uh, and don't hesitate to contact to us. Feel free to send an email or maybe you can call to uh, Lucas or maybe Telugu Radio. We will help, we will help. So we will continue to this show every Wednesday, Central Time, 6 p.m. every Wednesday. So you can tune Telugu Radio Facebook and uh, you can ask, directly on live so yeah today is uh, we are ending the show we can we are now we are signing off the lucas from dallas and uh, lucas from dallas wenger from houston signing off thank you thank you lucas thank you very much today's show this is uh, today's session is a wonderful show uh, wonderful information we got more information about the process and the new administration the biden new administration what will going to be take the or maybe new implementation on new rules and maybe uh, removal of Trump administration rules. So you told a lot of good news. Hopefully the same good news will hear every month and continue to get the green card. So hopefully get everyone green card and uh, be happy. Touch wood. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucas, joining with uh, today. Thank you, everyone, to joining today. And um, maybe you can share or maybe you can comment on our show and we will improve. Maybe we can uh, add more topic. If you, if, you, if you have any topic, we can add more topic. So tune Telugu and our radio webpage every Wednesday, 6 p.m. Central Time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Signing off, Venkat.